I'm usually willing to discuss just about anything. Um, I've tackled subjects like race realism um, rather recklessly, willing to actually engage race realists on um, their own terms. I feel confident enough to go in there and actually deconstruct their own arguments, and I'm not afraid of the results that, I'm, that I may stumble across. Um, as I say, I, I, deep down, I really do think that I can actually debate, discuss, and debunk uh, scientific racialism without having to sort of worry about um, going where one oughtn't to go. Um, you know, the, I, I've actually gotten into other subjects like that. Some people would say that, say, my long brush with antinatalism of a certain kind um, was kind of like that. I was willing to sort of go down the same road with them and say, okay, uh, accepting all your premises or uh, accepting whatever premises I can't out and out refute, let's see if we can lead to that conclusion. Um, and, and as far as race realism, race realism goes, I think that the whole concept of race is crap anyway. And our whole idea of intelligence is so skewed that I don't think we really have enough tools to really discuss the issue rationally, logically, and, um, dispassionately, if that's what we're really trying to do. Um, a lot of people expect us to attack the motives of race, race realists. I don't bother with that. Um, I, at least not as much. Like, I don't say, you racist SOB or whatever. I just say, okay, make your case and let's see. I'm still perfectly confident to do this, and I'm perfectly confident to lock horns, say, with um, antinatalists of a certain kind, the sort of guilt-based or um, fear-based antinatalism. Um, as opposed to just the sort of, I don't know what you would call it, um, just the renunciatory view that, okay, I see what you're saying, but honestly, I don't think the world is worth having kids in, you know, that kind of thing, or it's not worth my while to do this, you know, or I opt not to do this or whatever. It's not that it's a disaster that we're having kids. It's just, well, it's just not for me and human existence really isn't for me all that much. It's kind of a modus vivendi and I'm cool with it. As I say, I just came back from India and, and uh, enough of my um, travels there dealt with uh, exploring ideas of renunciation. I have no problem with that. Uh, I'm, I've always been fascinated by the Jains and they're among the most renunciatory of the lot, or at least officially. They're humans like anybody else, right? Um, <clears throat> one of the, where, where it really gets sort of down to the wire is where the old one kind of got the better of me. I'll, I'll admit it. He kind he dared me in a thought experiment. He made a thought, exp he dared me to have a thought experiment about my own thought experiment where I was talking about what, you know, what is evil and how will we identify evil people or anything like this and how you can spin anything good as evil or not, not evil, but just not really all that good or laudable or anything where you can look at, say, an altruist and say that that, that guy or that person is just an ego maniac who just wants to self-aggrandize and have everyone love them and um, maybe get elected to high position, uh, this kind of thing. You, you want to be popular. You're virtue of signaling for a reason. Now, you can do that with all virtue. You can make it look awful. And, in fact, virtues themselves, if not approached in the, I guess, in a virtuous way, I don't know how you would put it, um, can become vices themselves, right? I'm talking virtue ethics here, um, as opposed to deontological ethics or whatever. Um, and that's kind of the way that my mind works, virtue ethics. Um, you know, if you have a, if any virtue you think of, say my favorite one is modesty or, um, or uh, humility, where people can become proud of how modest and humble they are. They use their humility offensively. They use their humility in a self-promoting, arrogant kind of way to just demonstrate 
you know, a lot of people say that that's how it works in the Islamic world. I don't know if I agree with that, but I, I can see that it actually could take on those sorts of dimensions. Like when you get to things like honor killings, which are pretty rare, but it does happen, I guess. Um, you can, you know, you can all, you can see that humility becomes a vice, and it's, you know, we we, we pride ourselves on our virtue in our family, and if anyone is unvirtuous or non-virtuous or vicious or whatever. We deal with them harshly, even within our own family. So in other words, I'm so proud of how moral my family is, and I'm so proud of how humble and how um, self-effacing we are, or how we don't violate any of the nasty rules of life. And if anyone in my family does violate the nasty rules of life, I'll kill them. You know, crazy traps like that. Um, now, the old one sort of said, okay, take somebody horrible and say, make that person into a good person or spin their um, activities or their mindset or their mentality into something good. Uh, mass murderers, Charles Manson, Hitler, whatever. Um, guy, I think his name was... Edward Brady or something like this that I, somebody I don't really know all that well, but you know, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to sort of think, okay, just think of a very, very, very nasty person and try and spin what they've done into something nice. The choice of my generation was of course, Charles Manson. He had, uh, he had a power that he exerted even from his prison power to frighten people. Um, how could I spin that kind of thing as possibly good? This is where, of course, the old one got the better of me. Um, because I'm as beholden to these sublogical things as anybody else is. Um, I, I could do it as a thought experiment inside my own head to sort of try and twist things around to make the Third Reich look like a very moral, upright, good thing. I can actually play that kind of game with myself in the privacy of my own thoughts, but do you think that I can actually bring myself to talk about it on YouTube? No, I, I couldn't do it. Um, and he's got a point, the old one. There, there is a point that, you know, okay, you can actually, you could come out and sort of turn everything into crap if you want to do all the goodness of life into crap, but can you bring yourself to turn all the horrors into good things? I could, but if somebody wants to say how you're going to, you know, let's have an example, a real historical example. Take um, uh, Adolf Eichmann and say, try and say this guy was good. Heinrich Himmler, Joseph Stalin, whatever. Now that is, I admit, a weakness in my argument because I'm talking about the intuitive and intuitively we don't want to get too close to that. We follow... Um, Gandalf's maxim that it doesn't do good to delve too deeply into the evils of this world. You might release a Balrog. Um, yeah, I, I feel that, just like anybody else does. Um, why shouldn't I? But I also feel equally, I don't know, I, I shouldn't say equally, but it seems pretty miserable to sort of want to make the world look horrible. Um, and reality to look terrifying. Now, again, there, part of me wants to do that. Love H.P. Lovecraft is one of my favorite authors because he's, a, he's able to make the world look absolutely and unbearably awful. Uh, this fascinates me. Not the world, but reality, the universe itself. This fascinates me. Um, but that's just sort of a reality. How about a being that's doing horrific things and is justifying it? Now, in my own defense, one of the things that I have to actually admit is, or I have to say is, this has been done, you see. This has been done over a long period of time in our history when people promoted what one would call totalitarian ideas. When people could just sort of calmly say, uh, yes, we know that um, a lot of people will be killed along the way, but building a socialist or communist utopia, it's worth it. Uh, it's regrettable that we have these huge labor camps, and it's regrettable that we have mass executions. But um, look at the end result we're going to get. Um, 
And a lot of people went along with that. A lot of people that one would assume would know better. Uh, and not just on the far left, of course. There's Nazism, fascism. A lot of people actually did act on that idea that what is bad is actually good. A lot of people did make the mistake that Walter Kurtz made in Apocalypse Now, if indeed it was a mistake. Um, it's implied that it was, and I tend to think that it is, because it's just as much a mistake as saying what, I, you know, what we would call the Pollyanna response or the Ned Flanders response. Um, instead of everything is horrible, everything is good, and both of them are terribly unbalanced. Both of them are, I don't know, it, 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 almost dangerous. Um, because my view is, if you deny the darkness in your own soul, then you're, you know, again, I'm just talking poetically here, but if you deny the the wills to certain things in your in your own mind, your own being, you're more likely to be surprised by them. Again, in the 1920s and 30s, Hitler strutted right into the open gap left by 19th century liberal optimism and said, that's all garbage and it's all wrong. It's just weakening us. Human equality, the rights of man from the French Revolution, uh, all this stuff, garbage. And people had taken it as axiomatic for so long that nobody knew what to do. Nobody knew, like, well, you can't challenge these base assumptions of our, of our civilization. And Hitler said, I'm a challenge in them. You know, um, Yosemite Sam-like. Um, I'm, uh, you know, you, you can say that I can't talk like that, but I'm talking like that, and what are you going to do about it? People just weren't ready for that. Um, they were taken by surprise by it, and a lot of people went into just blatant denial. There are people that uh, said that, yeah, we were, I was a, an inmate of Auschwitz, and um, even in there, we simply didn't believe that we were going to be gassed. It just, it, no, it, the, the world is not that insane. It couldn't possibly happen. Well, it did kind of happen, you know. It doesn't matter that we can't face the fact that it, that it could happen, if it's going to happen. And if you can't face the fact that it's going to happen, then you kind of facilitate it. Um, but you can't go too far in the other way and become obsessed by your fears of it. Because if you walk around convinced that the Nazi stormtroopers are just around the corner all the time, um, your life is equally worthless as if you actually are, in my opinion, in the concentration camp. You're not, you're not alive. You're kind of dead in a sense. Uh, if all you all your life is is fear of Auschwitz or fear of something horrible happening or fear of or, or a mad scramble to pretend or to not to pretend but to prevent something from happening, um, too much optimism is just as bad as too much pessimism. Um, because again, too much optimism means it, it is, in my opinion, a species of denial. You're sort of saying it's just not in there. And therefore, I don't really need to worry about it. Whereas other people will say it is in there, and we do bloody need to worry about it. Now, which is the right way to look at it? I would say, again, it comes down to a question of balance. What kind of a world do we want to live in? What kind of a, what, what, what kind of a set of circumstances on this planet would make, make us most truly ourselves, most truly human? Um, well, what is most truly human? Hmm? Are we at bottom murderous savages um, who are just, we just want to actually destroy everything and dominate each other in, in the kind of way that Nietzsche gets parodied? Or is that simply part of us? And it's not the part of us, it's just Okay, it's there, that's all. We need to kind of balance it all out, lest one should take over. And if one takes over, if too much, quote-unquote, goodness takes over, you get sterility, and, and if too much, quote-unquote, evil takes over, you get chaos and madness. Which is it? Which is the one that represents the more truly 
human uh, picture, the most truly human equation as to how we define ourselves or how we even are, regardless of whether or not we define ourselves or what we want to be. What are we? Again, I think that we're all of it. And the horrors that are in the back of our minds are just part of what we are. But it's a part that we are afraid to approach and to sort of put too much emphasis on. I think that there's some sort of idea that it's kind of a chain reaction that may take place where we gaze into the abyss, the abyss gazes back into us, and we become that dark abyss that we have gazed into. Um, well, I would say that if you already admit that the abyss is in there, you don't end up staring into it forever. You just look at it once in a while and say, yeah, there's the abyss. Okay. That's, I'm more than that, right? Um, so I think that there is even a healthy way to face our darkest fears. But again, I assume these things have to be approached with great caution. And a lot of my sort of love of darkness, I believe, is an attempt to do this. An attempt to sort of tame the beast, I suppose. And not even necessarily tame it, but calm it. Say, so, look, I'm not going to try and kill you, Mr. Darkseid. Uh, so you don't have to go all Char Charles Manson on me. Um, you don't have to try and take over my entire being because I'm going to try to kill you. No, I just want to know what you are, Mr. Darkseid. Um, and I want to see if I can, if there's any way I can give you what you need and what you want that in such a way that it won't harm anybody. Now, I, I imagine there's any number of ways we could do this. In the old days, you joined the army or joined a pirate crew and went off and fought a war on the other side of the world if you're so inclined. We don't have that option anymore. So now you turn on your TV set and you see some brutal violence or zombie apocalypse or some reality TV show about a mass murder or whatever. You're kind of feeding the beast that way, right? Virtual reality will probably have all kinds of ways in which we can feed the evil beast. Uh, imagine if we're all in the matrix. Okay. I can sort of push a program and suddenly I'm a concentration camp guard, but nobody actually gets hurt. Um, I just sort of indulge my inner demon and nothing happens really, but it seems so real to me that, you know, okay, I've done that. Um, you know, you could say that that's one, of the, one good thing to say in favor of being in the matrix is that you can do whatever you like and there are no consequences. Um, virtual reality kind of works like that, right? You can say, okay, well, it's all very well, but it's not real. Like, you know, the objection to pornography, you can say, okay, well, it's all very nice, but it's not actually happening and uh, it doesn't really satisfy the needs that humans have. Yes, but if it prevents a rape, I guess, um, one could say that it might not be such a bad idea. Uh, so as, as well, if you're, if I'm constantly watching violent TV shows or something like that, or if I'm in a violent or terrifying virtual reality or something, I'm feeding or at least mollifying the inner beast. I'm giving it what it needs, what it requires, what it wants. Um, yeah, sure. I, I think that there are safe ways to face one's fears, but never underestimate them. Never underestimate the power of raw terror. Um, understand what it is. Um, I've often said that a lot of people say the depressed mind is incapable of actually conceptualizing the good, an actual enhancement of an, uh, of a pre-existing equilibrium in life. In other words, let's say you're neutral in terms of how you view your life, life in general, the universe. A lot of people who have actual depression can't imagine an enhancement of an equilibrium. They can't imagine goodness. Um, I know all about that uh, from my past brush with severe depression. I know how that works. But by the same token, some people who are living in this pleasant little enhancement can't imagine darkness being as dark as it actually is. And that, too, is dangerous 
and imbalanced. Um, there's something ostrich-like about that, right? You don't even want to know uh, that there are bad things happening because you don't want it to ruin your comfortable little existence. Um, la, 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 you know, that kind of thing. Um, Pollyannaism that goes toxic. Uh, species of denial. Again, traditional religious societies that live in these little bubbles uh, tend to operate that way. You just say that the worst thing in the world just isn't there, or it's just an evil thing, and we have all we have to do is anathematize it and fight against it all the time. And that's as far as your thoughts really need to go. But then when you're faced with a truly nasty situation or a truly nasty dilemma, you're not prepared for it because your self-conditioning or societal conditioning hasn't allowed you that kind of psychological or emotional latitude. Um, how does one face one's fears? One's deepest, darkest terrors. They're in there. And they need to be accommodated, if nothing else. How do you do that? Well, I would say with great care and with as much self-discipline as you can muster. It's like the dichotomy, the, the Nietzsche's famous dichotomy. Here the ways of men divide. If you want peace of mind, happiness, and a comfortable life, believe. If you want to become a disciple of truth, then ask, inquire, go ahead. But you've got to make up your mind at the beginning which pill you want to swallow, red or blue. And you've got to somehow understand what you're doing. Um, I find that swallowing the red pill is just, it's not as all-embracing as one might think. Uh, it's not an actual fork in the road, but it is sort of an invitation or an opportunity to widen your vision a bit, to sort of go beyond this duality, this binary of good and evil. Um, I don't think that the fork in the road is that stark, and you can do it slowly and over time, kind of in the same way as stoic habit forming works. You can't let yourself get jolted like that. Uh, suddenly facing the, your worst nightmares when five minutes ago you were living in an artificially wonderful bubble, cocoon, whatever. That's what the problem is. It's when you just haven't allowed for it that it can take you by surprise and horribly by surprise. So yes, maybe I wasn't, and maybe I'm still not prepared to go through the thought experiment suggested by the old one, where, you know, make Charles Manson look good. But it's been done. It has been done, and within living memory. Um, do you have the capacity to, like, I originally posited the thought experiment, do you have the capacity to somehow bring yourself to imagine um, approving of the ritual slaughter of animals. Um, you know, you can go, you can take that a lot of steps further if you want to go into, say, human sacrifice or something crazy like that. Again, it's just a thought experiment, but it does seem to be I'm crossing a line here or I'm getting close to a line or something like that. Even if you can't do it openly, can you do it in here? I can, or I believe I can. Um, I know what existential panic is, and I know what ex existential horror is. I've faced these things. I don't think I've defeated them. I don't think you can. But I think you can put them in their proper place. Yes, it is there. And yes, I acknowledge it. But it's not all that's in there. There's all kinds of other stuff in there. It's just when you don't believe that it's in there, and it surprises you that it's so horrifying and it can destroy you. 
So I guess, again, like um, that poem about Mithridates, he died old, A.E. Houseman, the uh, Shropshire lad. <clears throat> You've got to feed yourself this stuff in small doses. Otherwise, um, and over a long period of time, otherwise you could have the nasty experience that a lot of Germans and Russians went through in the 20th century, where you just woke up one morning and there was blood all over your hands and you didn't understand how you got there. I would say that kind of a person, the person who did this, is a person who dabbled in things that they weren't prepared to dabble in. Um, they didn't understand the n nuclear reaction they were going to set off inside their own being. They didn't grasp where that was going. So the best way to prevent that from happening is to imagine where these things do go. There's sort of a transcendental sort of way of looking at dualities and, and binaries and polarities. Uh, where you're not so much trying to tip the balance in favor of good or evil anymore. You're trying to transcend the whole thing, not just to transcend it, not for any particular advantage, but to see what you are and what reality is more accurately. Again, I like referring to Zafi's last messiah when he has his moment of existential horror and it kills him. He just wasn't ready to see the way things are. Um, Krishna, in or sorry, Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, where he sees the universal form, and it almost kills him, but because Krishna is there to sort of cushion the effect, it doesn't. Um, or Plato's cave dweller, who's suddenly jerked out of his comfortable little cave and sees the sun, sees birds in the skies for, for the first time ever. He sees actual reality as opposed to shadows. He may go insane. He may not, though. Now, how could a cave dweller, how could a denizen of Plato's cave, I'll sort of alter uh, the old one's thought experiment, how could a den denizen of Plato's cave prepare himself to get booted out into the cave, into broad daylight and actual reality? I think it can be done. It's going to take a lot of work, of course, but... What else is there? I don't think there's a great deal more than that. How do you face your fears? <laughs>